Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to V2, the Institute for the Unstable Media. My name is Michel van Arta. I'm one of the curators here at V2. And it's my uh, pleasure to welcome you to this lecture by Renzo Martins, Artistic Director of the Institute for Human Activities. Um, the program this afternoon is... Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Relatively straightforward. Uh, uh, Renzo will talk for approximately 30 minutes or so. We have the same amount of time reserved for a bit of Q&A and also for you to bring in your comments and questions in response to Renzo's lecture. And uh, that should allow us to wrap things up around uh, six o'clock already, after which you're more than welcome uh, to continue the conversation in an informal way here. The bar will be open. And also our beautiful Institute for Human Activities pop-up store will be open for uh, a lot longer as well because Tonight's the first Friday uh, of the month, which in the Witte de Wit quarter means that it's culture evening. Um, so this happens every Friday, uh, Friday uh, first Friday of the month, and this means that all of the cultural organizations in the Witte de Wit quarter have their doors open till nine o'clock. And we sort of came up with this idea to counterweight the, the shopping uh, going on every Friday, ni Friday night in uh, the city center of Rotterdam. Um, but I have to admit that tonight we're also very much targeting the shoppers. Uh, as you've seen on your way in here, we uh, developed this uh, Institute for Human Activities uh, pop-up store. And I would like to emphasize that this is not just a storefront. It's, it's actually a store that you can uh, purchase these chocolate sculptures in. And I would like to al uh, also invite all of you to consider this. Uh, our store, uh, our shop assistant can sort you out with a chocolate sculpture for the price of $39.95 and we're accepting cash and cards. Uh, before you run off, however, to uh, buy one, we're going to listen to uh, Renzo Martins give us a bit of background to these chocolate sculptures, uh, running us basically through the workflow that goes behind uh, these chocolate sculptures. Um, and that workflow is interesting. Uh, because it's at the heart of the gentrification program that the Institute for Human Activities is implementing in Congo. But also, uh, it's interesting because it's where V2 came in as a production partner. I'm sure that uh, Renzo uh, will uh, uh, run you through the whole uh, process, but at least part of that process is very much tangled up with technologies. And as you uh, hopefully know, V2 is a place that fosters a critical dialogue on uh, the impact that technologies have. Uh, so to us, uh, the Institute for Human Activities gentrification program is also an interesting case to look at how technologies impact a global economic system. I would like to come back to that in the, in the Q&A with, uh, with perhaps a few questions to Renzo. Uh, one more uh, practical announcement uh, on the Mercedes. Do you have the mailing list somewhere? There, there will be a, a small leaflet passed around. Uh, if you uh, put your email address on this list, uh, you will be subscribed to our monthly updates of projects, programs, and publications. Uh, please at least be so kind to pass it on to the person next to you so that Anna Mercedes can pick it back up uh, at the back uh, and subscribe all of these people to our mailing list. Um, before giving the floor uh, to Renzo Martins, I would like to first thank Renzo and the whole team of the Institute for Human Activities uh, for an interesting but also very pleasant collaboration so far. We're very honored to be a part of this uh, ambitious initiative. And we're also very happy that Renzo could make time uh, today uh, to explain to our audience uh, what, ac what it actually takes to produce these chocolate sculptures. Uh, Renzo, the floor is yours. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Michel, for your lengthy introduction. You almost said everything I wanted to uh, say, too. I'm very happy that we collaborate with V2. Um, indeed, it's a gentrification program we run in Congo. Um, and technology is a part of it, certainly. Um, maybe I first show you a little film. How will that work? No, yeah. no. I'm not so good in technology myself. Bon, je dis que c'est moi, il n'y a pas de sarre pour toucher le serment, il n'a rien. Tu gagnes combien tu Bon, tu gagnes combien tu touches combien Thank you. 
Jésus est chef de camp. Ah, ah, oui. Regardez-moi, ils sont un travailleur pour moi. Il n'a rien foutre de, de travail chez moi. On peut entrer On peut entrer. Regardez-moi. C'est capté. Vous travaillez pour la compagnie depuis longtemps, beaucoup des années Bon, ils sont que 25 ans. 25 ans Oui. Et l'huile de palme, ça va où L'huile, ma foute, hein, accueille le wapi. Bon, il n'est pas touché. Ça, c'est notre bulletin de paye. On est tapé. Voilà, on est tapé. Total de retenue, voilà. 38 000. 397 moins total de retenue 11 735 et le reste en ATP 19 261. Ça c'est pour combien de jours Non, ce n'est pas pour 26 jours. Oui, c'est 26 jours. C'est 26 jours. On s'en lève de voir. Avec ça, on s'est acheté beaucoup de nourriture Non, non, ça, ça ne suffit pas. Ça ne suffit pas. Le paquet de poissons coûte à 2 500, 2 000. Hein? Paquet de chicoang, 300 francs. Alors, pour un mois, il va consommer combien Alors, ça ne suffit pas. Trop insuffisant. Et avant, c'était pour unir le verre. Et actuellement, ce. Unir le verre, ils ont quitté quand Unir le verre, c'est à peine. Hein? C'est à peine qu'ils viennent de nous quitter. Euh, depuis. 2018, je pense. Et nous traitons actuellement ce ferron qui nous, qui nous a pris. Nous sommes maintenant sur le ferron. Avec Unilever, c'était mieux C'était la même chose. C'était la même chose. Lundi, vous travaillez aussi et mardi Mardi, oui, il oui, travaillait. Okay. Parce qu'il y aura un, une, une conférence, vous êtes invité. C'est moi. Oui, vous pouvez venir. Aga. Conférence, hein, conférence est allé. Mmh. Mmh. Mais vous allez inviter. La oui. conférence, Yohana. Oui. Yo, vous allez inviter la conférence. Ok. Alors, à quoi nous sommes Bon, c'est la date. Conférence. C'est mardi. Mardi. Mmh. Donc, mardi prochain. Mmh. Oui. Yeah, the part of the art world within which the Institute for Human, it, within which the Institute for Human Activities operates, let's call it the critical art machine, is very much uh, dealing with issues like precarious labor, uh, migrants moving around the globe, and global inequalities, um, and how art maybe can offer a counterweight by highlighting all these inequalities and maybe by creating little projects left or right around the globe to strive for equality and justice, things like that. Uh, critical gestures that, for better or worse, try to denounce capitalist exploitation. And yet, I found out uh, in my own work and in the work of so many of my colleagues that however critical one is of, for example, 
labor conditions on Unilever plantations in Congo, in the end, when you show that work in maybe Berlin or Rotterdam or New York, people will gather in Berlin, Rotterdam, New York, have beers at the bar, later out go, later on, go, on, go out for dinner, uh, have interesting discussions, write PhDs around it, produce more critical art. In the end, however much we deal with labor conditions in Congo, it only improves labor conditions in Rotterdam. And in a way, I think many of these critical gestures, including the ones I produce and have produced in the past, are more similar to Baroque trompe paintings. Uh, this is a, an example of a church ceiling. I think it's in Vienna. It offers you a beautiful picture of the heavens, of some beautiful collaborative project, if you will, uh, and technology-based, too, at the time. Um, it offers you a beautiful picture, but it doesn't really explain you what the structural and especially economic conditions are that are needed to build or to, to create such a beautiful collaborative exception to the status quo. And therefore, I think more often than not, the political claims of contemporary art are very, very limited. Yes, we produce critical gestures, but in its structural conditions, we create better labor conditions in Rotterdam and not in the many places that we critically deal with in films, installations, etc., etc. In the end, we accumulate artistic, economic capital in places like Rotterdam, which happen, by coincidence or not, also to be <clears throat> the very places where the industries that we critique are also producing their uh, uh, added value. In this case, Unilever, which of course has its um, headquarters in Rotterdam as well as in London. So Unilever creates, through its plantations in Congo, a lot of wealth in places like Rotterdam. And then somebody like me may, may well critique that, but I also create added value in Rotterdam and much less so in Congo. So. <clears throat> this whole phenomena of art, however critical it may be, um, producing wealth and uh, capital accumulation, it has a, there's a shorthand for it, it's called gentrification, and I guess we all know it quite well. Uh, I guess in the early 80s, uh, this was probably a very difficult area of Rotterdam, then institutions like V2 in Rotterdam or in Berlin, it would be... Uh, the Kunstwerke uh, start, uh, you know, making art shows and exhibitions, and the cappuccino bars pop up, and then five or ten or twenty years later, these uh, uh, poor inner cities become uh, hotspots for with very important real estate developments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all this is not really a coincidence; it's part of very deliberate policies. And I figured I, as an artist, if I really want to deal structurally with what it is I can do as an artist, I have to start my own gentrification program. I have to make sure that I am the one, as an artist, who takes responsibility for where it is that capital accumulation as a result of artistic critique occurs. So therefore, a gentrification program in Congo. Because as it is now, Persons like Mr. Mibale, whom we just saw in the little film, they gain nothing from critical engagement. However many films I may make about him, it doesn't do anything for him. He's never heard of uh, the scores of critical artists that fill biennials with artistic critique. He's never heard of them, and they have no significance to him. So <clears throat> I started, me and many other people, some of whom are here, uh, in this audience, my dear colleagues, we started this gentrification program on a former Unilever plantation in Congo. I will show you just a snippet of our opening seminar, which was three years ago now. Um. <coughs> Thank you. 
yango azali na biso awa te azali na mosika na Canada nde na science isali ete akoloba kuna biso to koyoka pe to komana na bilil Hi Richard. Hi. Thank you for uh, making time. Hey, how are you? Um, we're very good. We're in the middle of the rainforest here in uh, a place called Boteka in uh, the Democratic Republic of uh, Congo. And uh, we're nice. Yeah. We're sitting here with about 200 people who work uh, on a former Unilever plantation and we're building some kind of an art center here because we believe that there is a uh, you know, they too have to make a transition from the, let's say, the forest economy to something beyond that. Well, thank you. And I only wish that we could be with you today because as you may know, I just, I literally just finished and the 10th anniversary edition of Rise of the Creative Class Revisited. So I, I it's really fresh in my mind. And Wonderful. what's interesting is in that book, I began to think that when people talk about economic development, they talk about hardware. They talk about companies, they talk about technology, they talk about using tax breaks to bring a company to a city or a country. And I began to see that that wasn't the whole equation. Yeah. And then I was able to look at the trend in the rise of this group of people who is principally artists, designers, uh, uh, culturally created people, entertainers, musicians, writers, entrepreneurs, technologists, innovators, researchers, and professional people. And then I came up with a very simple model, a very simple model of, of what it takes to make a creative community, a creative city, a creative country. And I called it the three T's, uh, technology, talent, and tolerance. And when you put the three T's together in a community, that was the spur to this creative model of development. When studying development, artistic creation comes before roads, comes before schools, comes before hospitals. So in the development process, investing in artistic and creative infrastructure deliberately and strategically is quite important to an overarching strategy to achieve higher levels of development and higher standards of living. Right. We call this program a gentrification program. Um, we, we have the impression, or uh, you know, our, our little uh, new art institution has the impression that on the one hand, much new art deals with all kinds of economical issues and, and wants to be very critical of them, and which is very good, obviously, because there's many things wrong in the world and it needs to be addressed, it can be addressed through art. But on the other hand, the economic return of such art is hardly in the same places as what is critiqued. Let's say you could make a video of showing how poor people are in Congo, for example, but what happens is that this video is then maybe shown in New York or in London and generates an economy in London rather than in Congo. So this is something we would like to try and reverse. So we, we call it a reverse gentrification. That, that would be maybe a better, a better uh, way of putting it. Would you have any comments on that? Do you have, of course you've been, you know, some people don't like you because you, art would be instrumentalized by this creative class um, um, concept. We actually want to bring it further and make it really work and, and bring, up, bring about development and happiness. I, it's a very interesting um, intellectual, conceptual, and pragmatic uh, issue that you raise. And so I think those, those contradictions that you mentioned are part of the development of, of capitalism in the creative age. And I think it's incumbent upon us, artists and creative people, to lead in those struggles and, and not simply, and I'm saying this with all humility, complain. We're ready for one question here. There's a gentleman, his name is Rene Ngongo. Rene, will you come here and talk to Richard? Just a petite question. Je suis ravi par votre théorie des 3T, technologie, talent et tolérance. Mais je voudrais contextualiser dans le contexte, dans le cas du Congo, où certainement il y a des talents, mais qu'on n'arrive pas à identifier. Quel conseil vous nous donnez pour mettre en œuvre les trois T, particulièrement les deuxième T, les talents en RDC? So, Mr. Gongo is very impressed by your theory, especially by the three T's, the talents, the technology, and what was the third? Tolerance. Uh, and tolerance. And, and he's, he, he says it's certainly all here. What would you advise us, him, and, and all the people, to try and develop their talents? 
And I, I think that would be the final question also. I would do it together. We need, in this moment of crisis, new models of development. And what we need is experiments with new things that are engaging human creativity and developing the human spirit and human purpose and human meaning. That's what you can achieve with your project. You can be an experiment, and I think the world is very hungry. But the world wants a new model that isn't driving wages down, that isn't a race to the bottom. Yeah. And in the Congo, with what you're doing, you have the opportunity to show that in a place that isn't the wealthiest place on the planet, it's in a place that has struggled, you can put in place a new model. Yeah. Well, thanks, th thanks a lot, Richard. Uh, that's, um, uh, that, that's, yeah, that, I, it, I think it's what we're trying to do. Of course, there's more to it, but um, it, it's, it's really fantastic and uh, that you, you give us this advice. And I, I think you also, you know, we're kind of at the end of the scheduled talk, so, and I know you have many other talks to do. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of stop here, I believe. Thanks again. Yes. And, uh, and keep us posted by on how you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, Florida. <coughs> I thanked him, obviously, and I told him he had probably many other talks to do. He's flying continuously around the world to help cities become creative, creative cities. He's very well paid for it, so we were really lucky to have him for 15 or 20 minutes on, on Skype in Bottega. Um, he's very much contested also, uh, especially within the art world, because, as I briefly mentioned in the interview, many people think including me, that art has a political mandate. It's not only there to spur the economic, economic growth. It is there because art is one of the very few places that we have left in which we can think about what things really mean other than outside of only trying to make more money. <laughs> uh, and yet he proposes that uh, art is there because it you know, generates more wealth. However, I felt we really needed him to be there as part of our gentrification program um, because I think, as I mentioned earlier, if artistic critique on you know, some of the big disparities in this world in the end uh, generate this rise of uh, uh, cappuccino bars popping up in a few places in the world only, then, it's, then all of this artistic critique is not worth anything. So my idea is we should try and make sure cappuccino bars pop up uh, on this Unilever plantation too. And why there on a Unilever plantation? Because, well, first of all, it's here in Rotterdam. It's one of the very, very big companies in the world. Um, as you've seen in the beginning with Mr. Mibale, people there don't make a lot of money, some $200 a year. But also Unilever has for the longest time since the very beginning of the existence of the company has been funding critical contemporary art. The most recent examples of that are the Unilever series in Tate Modern, right uh, across the big Unilever headquarters in London, across the River Thames. Now Tate Modern, as you all know, uh, the former director of Boymans van Beuningen, Mr. Derkon, is the director of Tate Modern now. And they, over the course of some 10 years, showed the most relevant and most interesting and most critical and enlightened artists alive, including Bruce Nauman and so many others. The latest installment of the Unilever series was a fantastic piece by Tino Segal, who now has a uh, big retrospective going on at the Stedelijk in Amsterdam. Um, this was his biggest piece so far in this huge turbine hall dealing with immaterial labor. A fantastic piece, but something that the piece, in my mind at least, does not acknowledge is that it is directly or indirectly funded by the very, very material labor of people who will never ever uh, have a chance to even make a little drawing because they've never seen a pencil in their lives, nor could they afford one. So. It's kind of interesting, if Unilever can afford to fund fantastic art in London, how come on a plantation where the material wealth is, uh, is, is uh, uh, where it has its basis, why not there? And if art really has a critical mandate in this world, then what is it worth to only have it in the centers of empire, like London? 
Let me be clear, I do not want to undermine the value of artistic critique. I just want to make sh sure that, our, that, that we can understand better how it works, who finances it and where it, where it occurs, so that the political claims it makes that we can really maybe take them seriously. I think a piece by Tino Sugal in Tate Modern about immaterial labor that does not acknowledge the very, very material basis under it, that does not acknowledge it, that, not problem it, that does not problematize it, is not so critical after all, in my mind anyway. So again, I try to take into my own hands, take responsibility for where and how capital accumulation accrues. So we started this gentrification program in Congo on this uh, Unilever plantation. Because people can't live of plantation labor, maybe they can live of critical artistic engagement with plantation labor. So we started all these workshops in which people started making self-portraits and making drawings about their own lives and how they feel. The next thing we knew was that we were um, pushed out roads, public roads were blocked by a Canadian company that now operates really under Unilever, they still produce for Unilever. The drawings made by the children of plantation workers were confiscated and we've never seen them anymore. Uh, we had to leave. Uh, I will not go into details here and now, but it was a very gruesome uh, experience. So the place where we had the opening seminar and where we had by then been working with um, these plantation workers, we cannot go there anymore. Um, it's a, a lawless country, obviously, Congo, and this is how things go. But the orders came from London directly. Um, as a response, Mr. René Ngongo, whom you saw in the little film who asked a question to Mr. Florida, he's the former director of Greenpeace Congo. He's a good friend of mine. And he kind of co-organized with many other people the Congolese Plantation Workers Art League. This is an organization that brings together plantation workers from three plantations in that area, including the one that we were chased away from, uh, and also from another one, also close by, where people have been working for the last century to produce cocoa that is then exported mostly to Europe. Um, we had beautiful meetings. Uh, they took two or three days in which people really thought about, you know, what is our role in this world? We know so much about all these pressing images, uh, sorry, all these pressing uh, issues uh, that are deals with also, but you know, uh, income inequality, they really know all about it. Uh, an imploding social democracy or a small elite that kind of seems to run uh, things in this world, they know all about it. They also know all about war and uh, uh, things that may well be ahead for us too. Anyway, it's worthwhile listening to them, I thought, and I was very happy that this uh, organization was founded. Um, together with this um, Congolese Plantation Workers Art League, the Institute for Human Activities, we started this quite yeah, big operation called our Critical Curriculum, in which people, plantation workers, start thinking critically about their own lives and livelihoods and what it all means to the world. Um, in order to make money of it, of course, because that's what people need most. They want to be listened to and they need to make money because they're very poor. Hence our critical curriculum in which um, a number of people, we started with some 15 uh, three artists from Kinshasa lead these uh, series of talks and discussions and mm, every morning it starts with two hours of thinking through your dreams and what it all means and, and, and you know, what you basically w would do at Pete Swart Institute in, in, in Rotterdam too. Um, and people started making very elaborate self-portraits in clay, river clay. We are now on a, s we, after we were chased away, we kind of descended to river and then went upstream on a small tributary of another small tributary and there in this secret undisclosed location that's we where we are now and I will not tell you where it is but that's where it all happens the critical curriculum this uh, guy is Emery Muhanga working on a self-portrait 
you can see one of his sculptures in the little store right there. Um, we can't export these self-portraits. They're made in river clay. If you try and move them, they will break also. It will be very, very hard to import them here. There are all kinds of tax systems and, you know, completely impossible uh, for somebody like Emery to visit Rotterdam. Completely impossible. He doesn't have a passport. The chances of him ever getting a visa are next to zero. However, we were able to scan their images. We had 3D scanners and all kinds of materials. Um, and V2 uh, helped us figure out how to do that because we had no clue. Um, we scanned these self-portraits, so they now exist in the cloud. And we found, and that was maybe a little touch of genius, I don't know who came up with the idea, but it wasn't me, but um, we found that actually we don't need to export these sculptures because the stuff they do is already here. Amsterdam is the biggest cocoa port in the world. The cocoa that they produce, they can't get a visa, but the cocoa that they produce, it's there lying in these warehouses in Amsterdam and in Antwerp, you know, thousands of tons of the very stuff that comes from these very plantations. So the only thing we need to do is upload the feelings, emotions, artistic visions of these plantation workers in Congo, put them in the cloud, work them a little bit, you know, there's computer programs and stuff, and then we print it, 3D, what Joris is here, he figured out with the help of V2 how to print these sculptures and we found the cocoa in the port of Amsterdam and we found the very company that exports it from Congo and brings it to Amsterdam for us. They do this all the time. This is what you buy in the supermarket, chocolate from West and Central Africa. And we contacted them and they said, yes, of course, we want to help you. Here is, I don't know, 4,000 kilograms of chocolate. Part of it comes from Congo. And of course, that was fantastic. So we reproduced these self-portraits in the very stuff that they continuously produce for us anyway. And the only thing we added to this existing chocolate is the feelings, emotions, and the artistic vision of the people who actually produce that chocolate for us. Now, amazingly, this is some of the, uh, what one, a self-portrait by Mbuku Kipala, who is 20 years old and has four children and um, works uh, on, on one of these. It's no longer owned by Unilever now, but it's one of these plantations with a very strange status. They still produce for Unilever, but it's not owned by Unilever. And some of the self-portraits that you will find in the pop-up store. Um, Dutch and Belgian chocolatiers helped us with that. And then we started exhibiting them. Um, here you see uh, Jan Willem Janssen and his colleagues, uh, uh, star members of the Dutch patisserie team, who were, you know, on the basis of the technology that, we, that I mentioned, uh, able to reproduce these sculptures out of the cloud into the chocolate. Now, and of course the logo of our funder, whom we can't thank enough, Without them, this project would not be possible. Barry Callebaut, the Belgian chocolate producer. Um, now, amazingly, if you would compare what these plantation workers make out of the production of one chocolate bar with what they make after the sales of a same chocolate bar, but with added feelings and emotions, a little self-portrait out of the exact same chocolate, there is a, a, a raise in income of 7,000%. And that, of course, is, however critical I may be of him, exactly what Richard Florida proposes. The only thing, what, what is going to spur the economy is no longer hardware. It is not like make more chocolate or work harder or cut more, I don't know, work deeper in your minds. It is feelings and ideas and technology and talent. That's what's going to create a new economy somehow. But of course, you know, most of the people on the plantation have no cell phone, there is no internet that works, uh, and, you know, we are trying to build a little place where, yeah, artistic engagement with very, very difficult labor conditions can lead to an improvement of those labor conditions through, for example, self-portraits. Um,
our goal is that in a short time from now, we're working very, very hard on it, uh, this gentrification program is really going to take off. Um, we bought a big terrain, some 20 hectares. People are continuously making more sculptures. Soon at von Svelters in Amsterdam, there will be big shows as well as in Brussels and Berlin. And we kind of are developing a business program. And it's, we found out that if only we can sell about 1,000 of these little sculptures there, we can enormously improve the livelihoods of these people. But most importantly, with this money, we can build a site in central Congo, in central Africa, where art can fully deal with its own dependencies on global capital streams. So that artistic critique, as I pointed out in the beginning, it seems so sterile. It only functions within uh, places like these, and it has very, very little impact on the parts of the world that, in word or in name, it engages with. So we're trying to make sure that Congolese plantation workers in a few years from now, too, we'll have, be having these debates, we'll be discussing what we do, we'll have cappuccinos, and then later on, gin tonics at the bar. Thank you so much. Oh yeah, I should, I should mention, so these, I would say, beautiful art pieces are for sale at only 39.95, and I guarantee personally, none of it goes to me. It entirely goes to the people who uh, who made these self-portraits and the whole process. You know, you need to scan it and this and that and the other thing, but uh, it goes to them. And um, uh, we we were there just. Uh, I, I came back uh, this last Monday uh, from uh, our plantation, our settlement on the plantation, and um, yeah. When I came back with the first paycheck, um, the party was just beyond belief. <laughs> yeah, so you can help. Thank you. Thank you, Enzo, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, please stick around, because uh, we're going to handle some oh, yeah. questions from the audience. Sure. Uh, but before I uh, open, it, uh, open this Q&A to the audience, I have one for you as well, because I think uh, the issue of human activities and its gentrification program also makes a very interesting case in a long-standing debate. And that debate uh, goes like 10 years back, I think, when Thomas Friedman published his famous book called The World is Flat, in which he basically advocates the vision that technology eventually will make the world flat and will create equal opportunity for everyone in this world, yeah. also economic opportunity. Uh, this was heavily critiqued at the time by uh, people such as uh, Richard Florida, mm. saying uh, technology will only make the world more spiky because technology will concentrate in these very rich areas of the world and will therefore only emphasize these differences. Um, now, I was always with the Richard Florida camp, mm. uh, but having this experience of, of working with the Institute for Human Activities now, I'm thinking, wow, technology can actually open up uh, this global economic system to the disadvantaged. Uh, do you agree on that? Yeah, that's the difficulty, I guess, of this whole project. On the one hand, we're trying to analyze things the way they are, and that is indeed that it's spiky. As I pointed out in the beginning, I think maybe we should explain what Florida meant with spiky. Um, it, certainly, more and more people in the world have cell phones. Um, <clears throat> and yet, there is a gigantic urbanization going on, and uh, even in the Netherlands you see that the places where really debates are happening are shrinking. It's not, there are, you know, uh, Rotterdam is rising on the rise again, and, and so is Amsterdam, but many other places of the country are, are losing people and having, having an internal brain drain. And worldwide this is even uh, much more the case. There are maybe by now 10 big urban centers in the world where almost all uh, new ideas are being developed. Um, and so big parts of the world are becoming more empty because you can leave it more easily. I, you can enter into a discussion with people in New York, but it means the discussion will be in New York and not in, I don't know, Zutphen. So um, that's, it, it becomes more spiky indeed. Um, the trouble with a project like this is that on the one hand, we analyze what is happening, and on the other hand, by reproducing it a little bit, we are we hire Richard Florida to talk to us in the middle of the rainforest. It's a gentrification 
program for God's sake. So in the end, we're going to push people out of sight of their houses because we need bed and breakfasts for Dutch art critics and things like that. And we will do it. This is just the way things go. And we need to understand how things go. And if we want to know how it goes, we need to partially reproduce it. So um, it becomes spiky. And on the other hand, we also want to create tiny, t tiny little exceptions to the status quo and see if that works too, maybe. Um, maybe a project like this could be could be could be scaled up could go to i don't know textile workers in bangladesh maybe they could embroider their tears into my h&m clothes and then maybe then it, i will they h&m will sell it for the double of the price or something i don't know certainly it's good to have new ideas and think them through but it was already a problem marx had no on the one hand you want to analyze what is happening and you will the tools for your analysis will be um the dominant the dominant rules of the game. Uh, so in this case, it's neoliberal economics, and so I use neoliberal economics. Gentrification, artistic critique, what is it good for? It spurs the economy. I wanted to spur the economy in Congo and not just in Rotterdam or, or Berlin or New York. So I will bring the technology there. So, and so, then I so, create so a basically you're saying that the world is spiky, Yes. Uh, but that can be challenged. It can be challenged, but the real challenge is will it only be challenged on a symbolic level? Mm -hmm. Is it only for fun to entertain you and myself and a few people in Congo? Or is it really offering an alternative? Um, that's a hard thing. My Sana, who is in this room, she worked for four months, I believe, now on creating this business model through which really it's going to really take off in Congo. And it's hard work to figure it out, and we're still not... Yeah, if you buy more of the sculptures, it will be easier. But is it going to create long-term effects? Um, so far, we find that the big centers of economic activity are also the big centers of critique on how the economy is organized. So that in itself is proof to Florida's case okay. in point. Okay. Who wants to kick off with the first audience question? Over there. Uh, Bilko, do we have a microphone over here? Um, Renzo, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have uh, one short question. Uh, you once wrote an open letter to uh, Tino Segal concerning the, uh, the Unilever series. Did he ever respond um, <coughs> in any way? Yeah, we met twice. His gallerists, well, one particular gallerist of his is, is, is not favorable of a ongoing collaboration between Tino and ourselves. Uh, he thinks, the gallerist thinks that, <clears throat> because we wanted, Tino made fantastic works. He's certainly one of the geniuses, uh, genius artists uh, around. No doubt about that. Um, he made this fantastic piece. It's called This is Exchange. And what happens is you enter into an exhibition space and um, there is nothing other than a museum official who comes to you and asks you to tell him or her about a personal experience with the market economy. How does the market economy affect your life? Or uh, tell us about how you engage with the market economy. And then, so you as a visitor, you say, oh, this or that happened to me or something. Then if this museum official thinks that was a beautiful story, you get a voucher. With the voucher, you go to the entrance uh, place and you get your entry money back if it was a beautiful story. If, however, the museum official thinks the story wasn't so good, you don't get your entry money back to an exhibition again where nothing is to be seen except your own story. Right? So that's the piece called This is Exchange. And we thought it would be tremendously interesting to have this very same piece uh, on this Unilever plantation that you saw in the beginning. So Mr. Mibale, whom you saw at the beginning, uh, can enter, you know, you build a little uh, shack and uh, he, can, he has to pay 50 francs or a half a day salary or something. He can talk to us about the market economy. If it's a beautiful story, he gets his money back. If we don't think the story was so great, well, that's where the exchange ends. So I suggested to Mr. Uh, to Tino that we would, you know, do his piece on the plantation, but he said it was not the right context. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't know why. 
He's okay. funded by them. He's funded by Mr. Mibale, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, there's two. Uh, let's start in the back. This is a short question. Um, I take it, or I took it that you were a bit careful to explain why you were evicted from the first location and that the, the current location is a secret. Um, but I still wanted you to explain a little bit more about what happened there, if possible. <coughs> yeah, I, you, you, you observed it quite rightly. Uh, I, I did not expand on it very uh, much. Um, we, we, we tried everything to be in good relations with this uh, company. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it is called Feronia. It produces palm oil that goes straight into Unilever's Blue Band. Um, of course, Unilever has now become a sustainable company, and they're also very ethic now. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's all a mystery how that works to me. Um, and we just started our critical curriculum there, and we had lecture series, and people made drawings, you know, how do they see their future, stuff like that. But it seems that the company management, uh, based in London, thought that we were disturbing the everyday routine of their employees, I imagine. Or, and, and they didn't want us to be there. And, and, and maybe it went out of hand, maybe they didn't mean it that badly. I don't know, it, it's all very mysterious to me. Um, but one thing is clear, we cannot operate there. They made us understand that. Okay, can, I, can you pass the microphone on to the front? Uh, my, uh, but there was one more question in front and then we'll pass it back to you, okay? Yeah? yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, maybe an observation which hopefully turns into a question uh, related to what you were talking er about earlier, uh, the notion of scale. Um, because that reminded me of two other uh, art projects by a politically engaged artists uh, related to Africa. Of course, uh, the famous one by Christoph Schlingensief, uh, the opera village in uh, Burkina Faso. And uh, more recently, uh, Jonas Stahl, who mm. went to Mali to support uh, the independence uh, struggle by the people from Azawad. And, I mean, I sense the same uh, strength, uh, perseverance and engagement in all three projects. And I just wondered, uh, how do you relate your project to those other two? And could you maybe... Uh, uh, imagine, you know, teaming up, for instance. Mm. Well, Christoph is no longer alive. I know. <laughs> Jona still is. Um, I think the projects are different. There certainly are also uh, uh, resemblances. But what certainly is different is that um, I try to avoid making all kinds of critical gestures. I think they come too cheap. They certainly come too cheap for relatively rich, well-educated, and well-to-do people such as ourselves here. Um, I want to create, uh, I want to generate knowledge on the status quo, not just offer tiny, tiny exceptions to it. So my end game, in a way, is that we can understand more deeply or analyze more deeply what art's mandate in this world is. And the fact of the matter is that it's completely dependent on capital. Uh. So are you saying as long as it doesn't bring in any money, it's actually no good? No, what I mean is that um, where art is, where it is, where it can afford to be critical, where it can afford to, it is completely dominated by, by, where, by, by corporate interests. It's no I coincidence, I imagine, that Unilever funds big um, shows with really politically charged works by Ai Weiwei and Tate Modern in London, you know? against oppressive governments in China, but at the same time on plantations in Congo, run indirectly still by them, uh, people are not allowed to make drawings. So, yeah, what can I do? Offer like tiny exceptions to it? Or can I maybe build a, a, a self-critical, self-analytical body 
and that's my goal, in which art can fully come to terms with what it is to inhabit these times in which where art can afford to be critical is dominated by, yeah, by corporate interests. I want to shed knowledge on that rather than having the, the, the pleasure that comes too cheap again of, of being revolutionary for five minutes. We'll tell Jonas. He knows <laughs> about it. He knows what I think about it. And the other way around. Yeah, um, yeah I, uh, I, there's a qu quite a few more questions, but I promised the men in the back, in the middle. Uh, hello, thank you. Uh, I would like to maybe pose a question. I don't know if it has an answer or not. As opposed to more like Western-centric uh, gentrification projects, this one, as was stated before, seems to have like a clear opposition to it. It does not represent the interest of the people running the plants or uh, the people that actually pay the workers to see an increase in their level of, uh, like in their everyday existence. And uh, I was thinking, if this takes off, as you say it should and it would, isn't there a possibility that in the end it all becomes kind of this game of being locked in by how much they allow you to develop? In a sense, you're always relating to their opposition. You will always, I guess, have that opposition, at least at this Who initial is they? stage. Who is they? Uh, the companies that pay the workers. Not they, uh, where they, just the companies. Um, isn't there that risk that, uh, yeah, it, Unwillingly, you always have to relate to that and you will always be locked in in your process and they tend to have more control over it than uh, just you and your initiative. They tend to run the game in a sense too. But this is the status quo. This is how it is. You are, your analysis of what the danger is, this is exactly what it is. Uh, uh, I, th that's what I want to find out, that's what I, I, I specifically want to be in a situation where I am locked in. Okay. We are locked in here too. I think much critical art, you know, offering alternatives, as I said, maybe a little bit, uh, that, that didn't do justice to Jonas or Christoph Schlingensief, but being revolutionary for five minutes. Um, w the problem is with it is that it, you know, when you go to the Sao Paulo Biennial or the Venice Biennial or, or, or the Istanbul Biennial, you see many pieces that critically engage with precarious labor and migrant movements and how unequal it all is, etc., etc. We know that in the end, is what it does is it boosts the tourist industry to Sao Paulo and Venice, and that's why it's funded. Let's be clear, that's why it is funded. And if we're really lucky, then there's a great curator, like, I don't know, Charles Escher or somebody, who uses that fact that he needs to promote the tourist industry to really build fantastic and critical art exhibitions. If we're really lucky, there are very fantastic curators. And it happens sometimes. Uh, Charles, indeed, would be an example. But still, we are locked in. Uh, we art production, the way we are observing it here, or maybe are implicated in it here, is impossible without global economic segregation. None of the material we have here would be possible with, I wouldn't even be dressed if it weren't for people working for me for $20 a month. I would not have clothes on my body, yeah? So let alone that we would have this conversation. So I want to fully deal with that rather than create little exceptions to the status quo. But it's complicated, as I pointed out, it was already Marx's problem. How do you, on the one hand, criticize the status quo with its own narrative, and on the other hand, create an alternative? Because, of course, you do want people to have food in their body, in their bellies, and you do want to, I do want people who can't, who would never be listened to, like plantation workers, I want them to be part of bigger, debates, especially because we could gain so much from what they have to tell us. Okay. One, there were three more questions, one in the front here. Oh, well, yeah, let's, let's, let's have your question first, and we move to the front, and then there was one, oh, three more here, but they have to be short ones. Yeah? Um, hi, um, my question is very much related to the previous question, and uh, um, I'm, I'm interested to know what is the how you perceive the future of the institute there. Uh, as long as I know it's a five years project. Um, 
how do you project yourself in order to this to to take off the gentrification program to really uh, to take off because for what i i mean the incident if you can call it like that with feronia already affected enormously about what you have building up there for two years probably um but then if let's say that in two years time then this project is over then one of the dangers of, of the project is that remains a small gesture again yeah. uh, which actually is what you are trying to avoid yes no very good point <coughs> it's a five-year project in good you know soviet style tradition five-year project and then you start a next five-year project and another one and another one so i think i'll be there still until I, I'm actually planning to retire on that very uh, plantation in 20 or 30 years from now. Um, maybe part of the gentrification program can be a home for old men who need to be taken care of. Um, that, you know, I will, I will, I will uh, volunteer. To so anyway, long term, yeah. Oh, that would be even better if I could. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. We're actively creating dissent, actively helping people to oppose me and my colleagues so that they can take over as soon as possible. That would be great. Yeah. We're moving on to the question in the front. Yeah, my question is quite similar as well. I just wanted to ask yeah, when you move from there, when you leave, um, critical expression is something that comes through studying history. You're talking about various artists and, and historians and philosophers here and for the people there to I mean do you imagine it to be a multicultural place or mostly the Congolese having their own critical expression there because I can see it being a multicultural area where you know there's a lot of excited artists wanting to express themselves and and be part of an amazing project but I think it's more of a the intention that it's the Congolese people who are being critical and being able to express? It could be both. It needs to become a hub for the global critical art machine, um, where they can, you know, people that really want to deal with, for example, Tino would want to really think through how would my piece in Tate Modern be if I would acknowledge the fact that my, my meditations on immaterial labor are actually funded by very material labor of people who are not paid enough to feed their children. How, you know, where can I study this issue? Well, you can't do it if you go on a residency in, uh, I don't know what, uh, um, in some museum in at MoMA or Tate, or, but you could do it at uh, the settlement of the institute because that's exactly what is at stake there. Um, so we're open to many people and many ideas. It's, you know, the more the better in a way. Um, and a very important project, of a, a component of it is that plantation workers, who of course have great artistic talents, at, at least not more or less than anybody else uh, here, for example, that they too are part of it. Um, and they, yeah. So it's, I don't know if multicultural is the right word, but uh, certainly it's open for many, many, if not all, people just to prevent her, that the Congolese people be pushed out of there uh, because maybe they yeah, they have very great artistic talent but you want them to be perhaps more dominant or um, let's say powerful or confident mm. to stay there and not be pushed out by people who assume they have more creativity or critical thinking skills. That would be horrible indeed. Yeah, I think the, the scenario you sketch now is is certainly one we shouldn't uh, we should try and avoid. But it, yeah. So far, we had some people that came in residency and that did talks and spoke about the history of the white cube, for example, or uh, God knows what stuff like that, and it works extremely well. It's beautiful to talk about the history of the white cube while at the same time five me min five meters away people are artisanally pressing palm oil that is then going to be shipped to for the blue band uh, 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 butter that Unilever produces uh, and that funds white cubes in London. It's, you know, that's really what the project is all about. But um, more importantly, I would say indeed is that people who so far have not been allowed to be part of these global debates that they, that we build a platform that 
allow them to enter. And it seems to work. I mean, there are invitations coming from universities and shows and exhibitions and, uh, you know, it's, I, I think, beyond my control in a way, it may well start to work far better than I could imagine. Yeah. Okay. We have three more short questions. Uh, shall we start in the back? And then work our way to the front. We're already running a little bit late, so oh, yeah. please keep it short. Uh, yeah, I had a question. I was wondering, um, the cacao um, company that partly made your project possible, is that a fair trade cacao company or is it yet another Unilever type of company? Oh, a Unilever by now is completely ethical and uh, also sustainable. And okay, um, apart from that. <laughs> Uh, and Barry Gallabout has a long history of uh, helping its uh, cocoa workers uh, reach better standards of living too. Um, no, I can only be really grateful to Barry Gallabout. Okay. They do fantastic work, and they fund us. I mean, that is, they give us they give us a lot of free chocolate, and it would not be possible <laughs> without them. Okay. And it's really tasty chocolate as well. And. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, you're doing good promotion for our shop. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You could, you know, you you can eat it or shelve it away. It's, you know, the possibilities are nearly endless. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Th there was uh, one short question still in the middle here and then, oh, two in the front. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty much my question. But if, uh, if Unilever were to get on board or wanted to, you know, if we're smart enough to take it on, would you say yes? Absolutely. Kay. Absolutely. Yeah, I would love them to fund this project. I would love them to. That would be a big difference a little bit also with, uh, uh, to your previous question, you know? Do you, what is your difference, the difference between this project, for example, and Jonas Stahl's uh, project? I just strategically accept that we live in the world that we live in and see what that really means and what art's mandate within that world is. And uh, if Unilever funds State Modern and is able to churn out really critical artistic positions there, then why not on a plantation in Congo? I think that's what we should try and figure out because that's, of course, where the world is headed to. Uh, uh, money with little strings attached, uh, let's say social democratic money, is going to disappear very quickly. Uh, have you tried? Have you tried? To oh yes, it? yes. I sent them several emails, including to Mr. Pullman, the CEO of Unilever. Um, yeah, uh, he says it's a great project. We wish you a lot of good luck with it. Uh, thank you. <laughs> that's, that's great that encouragement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The last question here. Um, yeah, I was just thinking of another project in Congo, um, the Virunga. Uh, documentary about the mining company um, in the nature reserve yeah. and what different function does documentary play within the region and is it less or more effective or well in my own experience and and I will limit it to that here um, in my own experience uh, I, I made a documentary some kind of a documentary film about Congo and it, it dealt very much with the same issues you know uh, relentless exploitation and this and that. And also the fact that making films about relentless exploitation are almost as exploitative as the relentless exploitation itself. And that the, 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 the places where the profits accrue, both of the exploitation and the critique on the exploitation are the same. And the places where uh, people only give away raw material, whether it is their labor or their minerals, or allowing themselves to be filmed and photographed to see how bad they are, how, how sorry, how uh, bad off they are, uh, are also the same. So there's the same division in a way, whether it is exploitation or critique on exploitation, there's the same division between labor and profits, in my experience. I try to find a way to crack that nut. I think that's a beautiful ending note. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, How do you like our new logo? We, you must have observed there was another one, and now there's this one. Can we have a, a quick poll? A quick poll. <laughs> How many likes? <laughs> the, the old, old one? one? What's wrong with this one? Boring, Boring. okay. Yeah. <laughs>
All right. Well, <laughs> thank you so much. We can continue that evaluation over uh, over a drink later on. Thank, uh, you. thank you, Renzo Martin. Thank you. Also, uh, thanks uh, all of you for your input in this uh, Q&A. Uh, I think your questions were wonderful. I know a lot of you have to run off because there's a lot more to do in the Kunstavond, in the uh, Witte de Wit quartier. Uh, Mama, Tent, uh, Witte de Wit, uh, Warm, they all have programs tonight and they all have their doors open till at least nine o'clock tonight. Uh, but before you run off, I would like to also do a few thank yous. Uh, besides Renzo, there's a lot more people involved in the issue for human activities. And I would like to thank them for a great collaboration and for making uh, this pop-up store happen. Um, I would also, especially uh, Cathy Dehaan and Sonne Colette, who did a lot of work on it. I would also like to thank the Congolese plantation workers, Art League, who of course played the most important role in this, uh, perhaps. Uh, I would also like to thank a few people who've been uh, involved in the project here at V2. Uh, Wilker and Richard for building the pop-up store and also making, uh, preparing for tonight. Uh, Michel Kasperzak, Jan Miske and Anna Mercedes also did uh, valuable contributions to uh, today and to the project as a whole. I'd like to specifically also thank you Josephine van Kranendonk for all the communication around the project and Joris van Tuberger for his technical skills that he uh, put into the project and uh, to make all of this happen. Um, the bar will be open for a little bit. The store will be open till 9 o'clock tonight, so you have plenty of time to think about your purchase before you do it. Um, um, and tomorrow, oh, and if you really can't get enough, uh, the pop-up store is open again tomorrow for museum night from 8 to 12. Thanks a lot. <laughs>